Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Folks, welcome back to the ever humbly and originally named Pat Flynn Show. Eric, welcome back to the show, my friend. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Pat. Good to be with you. Yeah, so this is actually a take two of a of a conversation that uh, Eric and I had, and and I thought the first one went so well, but it was kind of cut short that I in- invited Eric back on to just not necessarily do a do over because that implies that the first one wasn't a ton of fun and productive, which it was, but uh, sort of a director's cut. Can we call it that? Yes, yes. Uh, so that means we do have to do some things over. Uh, um, you. Uh, are uh, an author, you are, well, I'm going to let you give your biography here real quick, if you, if you don't mind, a podcaster, you're a lot of different things. So just, uh, yeah. yeah, let's do some formalities and then we'll get into the to the good juicy stuff. Yeah, well, um, I guess the thing that we talked about the most last time is that I'm a convert from Protestantism to Catholicism, specifically evangelical, non-denominational sort of Protestantism to Catholicism. And in the midst of that conversion experience, I wrote a book uh, called Thoughts of a Changed Mind that really documented a lot of those paradigm shifts that took place. And um, over the last, well, until just recently, I was working at the same company after college uh, doing energy conservation projects, actually, for Christian ministries and school districts. Had tons of fun doing that, gave a lot of presentations, but my conversion to Catholicism, like, just gave me the zeal um, to just spread the faith and to share with people all those paradigm shifts that I had. And so I actually left that job just this March to venture a little bit more into these creative endeavors and started a podcast called Polycarp's Paradigm. Um, I upped my grad school classes. I'm currently getting my Master of Arts in Theology because a lot of my learning, um, I'm getting that from Holy Apostles College and Seminary, a lot of my learning was self-taught during that journey, and I wanted to kind of be guided more mm-hmm. and really get into Aquinas, honestly. Uh, and um, and so real, really right now I'm working on the podcast, a YouTube channel. I just finished my second book as far as writing it. Um, it may not even come out till 2020 because, you know, the process can take a while sometimes. Um, so I'm doing those things and focused on that. I just couldn't couldn't contain myself, I guess, and just stay at my job. So. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you about not being able to contain yourself, man. Is yeah. Jacked all my poor listeners to these talks of of religion and spirituality, yeah. right? Um, uh, well, because I feel it's important, and I feel it's the most yep. important thing that we can possibly talk about. So, if nothing else, you know, people might accuse me of being wrong. I don't think they could accuse me of insincerity, and it seems right. like the same goes for you. And I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, and a huge point in the zeal as well was just last Easter vigil in 2018. I mentioned it last time that both of my, both of my parents became Catholic. And I was, I mean, it was so funny because my dad and my mom, they were in RCIA for 15 months. So they took the long track. And my dad just said, you know, it takes a long time to get 69 years of Protestantism out of you. I was like, well, hey, it took a long time to get 27 years out of me when I became Catholic four years ago. And and I'm still getting the secularism and material materialism out of me. So I get it. Right. <laughs> it takes right. a while, man. Well, uh, it's like the ancient Israelites sometimes where they were delivered from Egypt in the slavery, but it takes a while to get, get the slavery mentality out of them and realize, hey, you're actually – free to go to the promised land now, Um, you know? (laughs) Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting, it's an interesting point. I mean, I'm constantly battling against old habits of mind, tendencies, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, doubts and and, and so on. So I'm sure that uh, even though we kind of came in from from different angles, that that makes a lot of sense to me, that resonates with me. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, let's go back a a little bit. And I want to really focus on these paradigm shifts for you and uh, explore, because look here, as you know, conversions are are difficult that i mean they really are um yeah. you know especially for me uh the type of life that i lived before the types of people i, I hung out with and associated with the, the the things i said about religion i mean i had a lot of egg on my face when i became a catholic my friend i really, <laughs> I, I, I really did it, it wow. really kind of like fundamentally turned 
everything about my life uh, inside out and is still doing that. I imagine that had to be very similar for you also, even though if you weren't going from non-religious to religious, just going from, it is a, a huge paradigm shift, certainly mm -hmm. to go from non-denominational uh, evangelical to Catholicism, correct? Yeah, and I think one of the hard parts with conversions and paradigm shifting is that you're given a certain picture of what the quote-unquote other side has to offer and what they're about. And so you have to first kind of dismantle that portrayal because what I found on my journey is like, wait, that wasn't accurate. The church doesn't actually teach that or actually they do teach this and I was told they didn't, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most fundamental ones was the whole concept of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Like it was understood in the world I grew up in, whether it was said or unsaid that Catholics don't actually believe in having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, they, I mean, some of them sure might be saved, but <laughs> probably not yeah, most sure of them, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I even went to uh, in high school, this Bible church with a friend one time for like this evangelism weekend and they said, we need to do evangelize Catholics like that they're not saved and that mm -hmm. whole idea. And even at the time, I was like, I don't know about that. But um, but I did have that caricature in my mind that they didn't believe in our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. And as an evangelical, that's what it's all about. So I was like, well, they're just missing it. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're guising their religiosity with all these rituals, but they don't have that relationship. Yep. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I get well, emails. Oh, that's not I, true. So <laughs> yeah, no, but but you're right that that is a view that uh, many um, in certain um, certain denominations they hold that view, and I can, I know because I get emails from these friendly people every week mm -hmm. telling me about my in, in, in impending um, stay in eternal hellfire, and that I need to find Jesus. And of course, I just reply with the meme that we Catholics never lost them, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, we try to be we try to be much more ecumenical than that, of course. Uh, but it is it is it is it is a common thing. Um, and and I told you before that before I became Catholic, I really did try to work out the Protestant position because mm -hmm. as much as I think um, uh, certain not obviously not I, I don't want to say all Protestants because that's just not true, right? But certain um, I don't even know how to best phrase this, but certain people who are Protestants, let's just say that, mm -hmm. hold, you know, um, hold the view, uh, a very, very nasty view of the Catholic Church. They, they, they see it as, a, as, a, as an utterly wicked thing. Uh, right. Some would even go so far as to say the, the Antichrist, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so as, as bad as that is, right? Um, it's not so dissimilar at, at coming from a secular viewpoint, which I was, right? Like, what is worse? What is like the worst thing in the world if you're a hardcore secularist atheist? Well, it's the Catholic Church, right? <laughs> it's like, so it, it's sort of the Antichrist to the secularist too. Interesting, so, yeah. Yeah, like this is like the, the bane and the blight that society has been fighting against since the, since the Enlightenment, right? Right. Um, so that was, that was my perspective. So, so again, not, ex not exactly the same criticisms, right? Mm -hmm. But I think we were probably coming from similar-ish perspectives where this, this, this thing called the Catholic Church is whatever it is, it's just, it just needs to, it's a problem, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And how dare they claim to know absolute truth or any objectivity in reality, you know, like how dare they, who are they to do that? You know, what's true for you is true for you. That sort of mentality in our culture, it, it does make it inherently anti-Catholic um, mm -hmm. because the Catholic church is saying, actually truth himself came 2000 years ago and he started our church and, and he continually guides us by the Holy spirit into all truth. And there is truth um, out there. And, and I think for me, that was a huge thing that, and I encourage my listeners on my podcast too. just, you know, please be a seeker of truth. There is truth out there. Seek it with all you have. Uh, I didn't, I don't think I shared this last time, but when I was in seventh grade, I was at a Christian camp. I actually got the Thomas award because I was a seeker of truth. I asked so many questions mm -hmm. of my counselors, like, well, what does this mean in the Bible? Or how do you, you know this and all this and this, and finally, I found great rest in coming to see that the Catholic Church is the church Jesus started, has been guided by the Holy Spirit, and as like we talked about last time, has just been consistent 
with her teaching for 2000 years. And I was like, okay, I don't have to just figure everything out now. I can humbly come under the wings of the church mm-hmm. and, and continue my exploration of tr- truth, having firm footing, f- firm grounding in that. Yeah. Having those, I, I sometimes say those bumper plates, right? Like as long as I stay within these bumper plates, I'm good to go. Mm-hmm. And I can, I can explore around in there. And that's, that was one thing. I think it was, I forget where I first heard this line when I was first kind of exploring Catholicism. I don't even remember if it was from a book or somebody told me. And I was kind of asking, well, what, what, like, how do Catholics think of the church? And I just remember mm-hmm. them saying, it, it's a truth telling thing. That's what it is. I'm like, it's oh, interesting. I never, never thought of it. Wow. Like, and then, uh, and then as you start to think deeper about everything that you just said, you see, oh, yeah, that's, that's actually itself a true statement. It is this truth telling thing. Um, and what's, yeah. And mm-hmm. what's interesting too is my friend Ethan, actually, he played a huge role in my conversion and he actually became Catholic a year after I did, but <laughs> wow, um, yeah. And I was his sponsor, but anyway, you know, when you're in that process of conversion, especially from one denomination or mindset like yours to, to the Catholic church, it obviously takes some time and some deep wrestling And uh, he likened it to, you know, looking at different uh, telescopes and like you're analyzing the telescope. You're looking at, okay, is this a good one? Then you move on to the next one. Okay. Is this good? Maybe you peek through the lens. It's like, Oh no, not really. It's kind of blurry. And then finally, like when you land on, let's say the Catholic church and you realize, okay, this actually is the telescope to which I can actually see the universe now. And now you don't have to even think about all the different telescopes. You're just like enjoying what a telescope is made for, which is to look into the heavens. Mm -hmm. Now that I've landed in the Catholic church, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's like, okay, now I can actually just, instead of questioning all these other things now, I can just enjoy union with God. I can enjoy the Eucharist. I can enjoy the Trinity and all these deep, deep mysteries that I can just like are knowable mysteries that, the more I know, the more I want to know sort of thing, but I can like rest in that lens, if you will. Yeah, that's a really good analogy. I'm going to, I'm going to quote you. I'm going to credit you on that three times. I'm just going to steal it completely. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> even though it's your friend. So he's going to be like, Hey, yeah, I stole from him. So yeah. it's all good. Yeah. That's right. You only need to credit him one more time and then it's yours. That's the perfect. Story. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of my favorite, uh, books, especially, I actually recommend this a lot to people who are interested in Catholic theology is theology and sanity. Have you read that one by Frank? No. Steve? So it's really good. And, you know, he kind of starts off by saying like, hey, to, to be sane is just to see reality for what it is. And the church is, is like you said, right? The church is showing you what reality for what it is. So being Catholic is about as sane as you can get, which is funny because I think Jordan Peterson, who himself I, is not a Catholic, I understand. He mm-hmm. just had a quote that's been going around where he, he, he literally said that he's like, to be Catholic is about as sane as it gets. So I wouldn't be surprised if in like five years that guy actually, oh. actually becomes Catholic. Yeah. Um, but I just thought, I'm like, that's kind of funny. Cause that's literally the thesis of theology and uh, of sanity that, uh, what the church says about the world, about God, about, about humans, about salvation, it's true. And to the extent that, you know, you're not seeing reality for what it is, you know, that arguably that's some degree of san- of insanity. So to be within the Catholic church and to see the, the world, the universe, life, humanity, God, uh, angels, demons, salvation, as the way the church sees it and teaches it, is, of course, to 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 become more sane. Um, and it's just a kind of a really interesting way that, that he develops that. Now, of course, this is all assertion. We got to make these arguments, right? But um, I think it's I think we're kind of getting at a similar theme here. So let's go let's go back to your mm-hmm. conversion process and let's just start uh, unpacking it. All right, what what were some of the views that you had about the Catholic Church? some of the initial big ones um, mm-hmm. that you began to change your mind on and what, what facilitated that change? Take us down that path. Yeah. So I already mentioned the personal relationship with Christ, how I didn't think that they knew about that. And really simply what changed my view on that, well, was two things. One was the opening paragraph of the catechism, all talking about a relationship with the blessed Trinity and how that's the purpose of of life. And so <laughs> that was one that got cleared up through that. I have the catechism in my hand. Do we want to quote it by the way? Yes. Oh my goodness. It's um yeah, it's right after the or it's in the prologue. It's the very first paragraph. I'll let you continue why I, I find the find the page here. Okay. Uh yeah. Uh oh wait, oh, hold on. I think I I think I got yeah, it. Paragraph one. Paragraph one in the prologue. Yep. 
uh, The Life of Man to Know and Love God, this one? Yep. Yep. God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. He calls together all men, scattered and divided by sin, into the unity of his family, the church. To accomplish this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son as redeemer and savior. In his son and through him, he invites men to become, in the Holy Spirit, his adopted children and thus heirs of his blessed life. That's I mean, a great, that, I mean, talk about good opening paragraphs. Right? right. That's like one of the best summaries of the gospel I've ever heard. So, I mean, right away when I was reading the catechism, I was like, well, that's beautiful. And I agree with everything that just said. So, yeah. <laughs> oh I my. told you this last time I want to repeat it is, is what brought me to the catechism was this kind of funny story. I was at an evangelical um, service and the pastor was, he was just railing against Catholicism and, and he just kind of went on this tirade of all these things Catholics believe. And, and it made me go, that sounds really weird. Like, does anybody really believe that stuff? And so I went on Amazon, which is funny to think that the, that the catechism is on Amazon, but it is. And it's got like thousands of five-star reviews, which is even funnier. Um, so I go on Amazon, right? And I get the catechism. I start reading it. And it sounds like similar to you, Eric. I'm like, wow, Catholics don't believe anything that he just said. Right. Like, not, not even close. Like he got that completely wrong. And there's no, there was no excuse for that. I'm not saying that this is every... And I'm not saying that there aren't serious objections to um, Catholic, like actual Catholic beliefs, but I was just astonished at, at how, how much this guy was just assailing a, a straw man, like a position that Catholics right. didn't even hold. And mm-hmm. it was because of that that I actually ended up picking up the catechism and started like being like seeing the sanity that the Catholic Church is and teaches that, that started to really open me up to Catholicism. So I, it kind of had, I guess, the opposite effect that he was probably hoping at the time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I I wanted to read the catechism. Well, first of all, my friend encouraged me to, and then also when I was in RCIA, RCIA, I wanted to read it again, which RCIA is just the class that you take to become Catholic. As you know, I'm just saying that for your listeners there yep. who are probably all wanting to become Catholic right now. Um, yeah, right of Christian. So- <laughs> you know what? I get so many emails, and like I need to do an episode on that because people people like just they don't know like how do I become Catholic, <laughs> which yeah. is which is amazing that people are wondering about that. But yeah, that's that's what you do. You you join the the RCIA yeah. program, right of Christian Initiation for Adults. That's that's exactly go to your local parish, connect with them, and you can enroll in that class. And I started that class as fifty fifty as to whether I was going to join. So it's not like you have to like be certain. Um, and then it was like six months into it where I was like, okay, I'm a hundred percent in. Yeah, mm-hmm. and. Actually, one of the big things I did, once again, you know, trying to be a seeker of the truth and trying to, honestly, I didn't want to be led astray. Uh, I, because I had these misconceptions that it was just a bundle of heresy that maybe this, I really thought that maybe this church was started by Constantine or something. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that there were early church fathers that go before Constantine, that there were bishops, priests, and deacons before that. Um, And so I put together an email list of about 30 spiritual mentors and leaders that I had growing up, all of them being Protestant. And I was shocked every time I would send an email updating them on what I was learning in RCIA that like, they were overwhelmingly saying, yes, that makes sense. Or I think you're on the right track. I was expecting everyone to rebuke me, you know? (laughs) Um, And so anyway, going back to the personal relationship with Christ, obviously the catechism played a a big role, but another huge part of that is learning the church's teaching on the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is Jesus Christ himself under the appearance of bread and wine. And once that clicks, and for me, I had a little charismatic background in my (laughs) pre-Catholicism, very into the gifts of the Spirit, miracles and all that. So for me, it actually wasn't a big stumbling block to believe that. It was, I was already predisposed to wanting to center my worship on the presence of God anyway. Mm -hmm. The only difference well, the big difference in my charismatic world is it was all a spiritual presence rather than the actual like incarnational presence of Christ. And when I discovered, oh my goodness, there's Catholic churches centering their whole worship, their whole life on, on Jesus Christ himself. And I get to be a partaker of the divine nature. I get to actually give my whole self to him and receive his whole self in the Eucharist body, blood, soul, and divinity. So when it comes to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, 
there's not a more intimate union even possible on this side of heaven. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, like learning that it's like, okay, count me in. Yeah. And, I want, I want that. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh, exactly. Yeah. And that was, that was one of the major things that, that got me. So I'm sorry to repoint these re, re have to, uh, retrot out this for you but since this might be the first conversation that people hear from us i'll just mm-hmm. i'll repeat it is that um when i was trying to work out the protestant position i could not like solo scriptura was just a non-starter for me it just mm-hmm. i just couldn't get it to work it, it seemed like and i i heard the jesuit and, and like the classic jesuit critique of that you know scripture doesn't come with an inspired table of contents i can't tell you what what should be included in scripture that's a huge problem mm-hmm. scripture doesn't interpret itself Clearly, I mean, I don't think of anything that could be more demonstrably empirically false than that beside the thirty to 45,000 denominations of Christianity we have right now, all claiming to have the right interpretation of Scripture, right? Right. And, and you know, three, Scripture um, does not teach you how to apply the consequences or, or lessons of Scripture to modern times. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and four, kind of most ironically at all, is it doesn't even meet its own standard. Like sola scriptura is just not something you find in scripture itself. So it's just, it's, it seems to be self undermining. And yeah. it wasn't, di- so I, like, I understand, like, if you grow up in the paradigm, right? The paradigm is a good word, where scripture is the only authority. Mm-hmm. I can understand why that would be hard to, to give up. It wasn't hard for me to give that up because I didn't grow up in that. I just tried to work it out intellectually. I tried to consider the best arguments for it and against it. Mm-hmm. And, and honestly, I, I, I thought it was terrible. I did. I said, like, this makes no sense. Like, at this point, I'm on no better ground, you know, in terms of epistemic justification than the Mormon or yeah. Jehovah's Witness or, the, or, 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 or uh, anybody who's Muslim or, or any, really any religion of the book, right? Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I need this. If like, if this is true, then like it should go all the way through. I should be able to intellectually affirm and defend this from start to finish. But mm-hmm. then if I, you know, you kind of you trace back historically and you see that, oh, okay, well maybe if there, if Christ left us with a church, but not a book and he gave his authority to that church and that church is, is, is principally guided and protected by the Holy spirit. And then through that church and his traditions of that church, uh, scripture is then uh, brought together uh, and and formally canonized. Well, then we actually have then we actually have really solid ground. Then then we're arguing in a in a spiral rather than a circle. And I'm like, that that's interesting, and and that actually seems to work. And it also seems eminently obvious because that's exactly what Christ did. He did like he didn't leave us with a New Testament. Like it, it, right. it wasn't like you know Pentecost came around, he ascended, and then. Oh, before I go, guys, here's here's the new test. <laughs> like that isn't what happened, right? It's I'm like, just imagining the Holy Spirit just saying on them in like a pile of books <laughs> instead of fire. <laughs> it's like so. Like, how do you deal with this as a Protestant? Like, how how can like I couldn't find I could not find a respectable uh, solution to that. Something that that I felt like I could honestly and intellectually assent to. Um, and once that's gone, once sola scriptura is gone, I mean, I didn't see many other options, honestly. But then, right. and I don't mean to hijack this here, but I know you're going to have a lot to jam off of this. When I went to the church fathers and mm-hmm. I saw their just undying, unyielding devotion to the Eucharist and the real presence and how much, how much they, how, how they really did see this as the source and summit of the Christian life. I mean, from Ignatius, Clement, Irenaeus, you name it. Like this, this, was, this was it for them, the, mm-hmm. the Eucharist. Um, that secured my conviction because I'm like, you know what? This is this is exactly what Catholics believe, um, and it is amazing to me, truly amazing. Like the only thing that can really explain why this has been preserved is because of of divine protection that they still believe this, mm-hmm. and that they and you know um, to this day after two thousand years, this has been preserved in the Catholic Church, and of course, it's been completely abandoned by, you know, like, as, as I'm sure you'll attest in, in, in evangelical Protestantism, like any talk of the, of the real presence or the mass, like the, there's no such thing as the mass right there. It's just, right. just not there. So it was between those two pillars for me. It was between not being able to work out soul scripture, seeing that the church had primacy and tradition mm-hmm. had primacy and it was necessary to even get to scripture and just the study of the church fathers, the sacramentality, and especially the Eucharist. So that was that's my condensed story. But now, take it. Yeah, from there. and and like like I said last time, I I 
grew up in a culture that kind of assumed sola scriptura rather than talked about it all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Bible is definitely emphasized like hugely. I mean, it was all about getting into Bible studies, reading the Bible every day. So yes, like I lived in sola scriptura, um, even if we didn't like talk about that doctrine or anything like that. Um, but I, I think for me, it was just a gradual frustration with that understanding because I kept hungering for the truth, right? And I kept hungering for answers and it's just a very confusing world. It really is because like, you know, okay, this person over here, they have the Holy Spirit, they're on fire with love for Jesus and they interpret this scripture to mean something completely different than what I'm interpreting to be. And I also have the Holy Spirit guiding me in truth. Oh, wait, and that's different than this other person over here. And so it's just like, who is right? And how can we actually even know the truth? And it's, it's, it's a restlessness that comes about. And like, at what point do you start seeing through the cliches? Uh, you know, every church I was a part of, just go and preach the gospel. Just go to the nation's church plant. Uh, preach the gospel. And it's like, well, what do you mean by that anymore? And like, what is church anyway? And like, and what gospel? That's what I wanted to what, know. Exactly. Because like, I, I go to like five different churches and there's five different gospels. Exactly. And there's different ways of entering into that too. Mm-hmm. Like all you have to do is say a prayer or this one's like, you got to get baptized or this one's like, you don't even have to do anything. You're just predestined, you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly it. Like, and these, and yeah. like, these aren't, and, 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 and like, don't try, really, like, and that's why I actually don't like, that's why I don't push mere Christianity. Cause it's not enough. These are hugely important questions. And depending on which one of these is true, right. they, they have significant consequences, right? <laughs> yep. And I was on a mission trip right actually before I started RCIA. So I was definitely, not Catholic. I had just gone to mass for my first time pretty much ever that July. So I went on this mission trip to Africa doing some business as mission stuff. And one of the leaders of the trip was an elder at this uh, Reformed Baptist church. It's really popular in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And so he's one of their chief leaders, you know, and he was like, you know, Eric, as long as we just major on the majors and minor on the minors, we can have unity. And I said, that sounds good. The problem though, Brian, (laughs) is that we have different majors. And you don't even realize that. Like you don't think about the Eucharist at all. Like you treat it as merely a symbol, this communion. And even if you didn't treat it that way, it's, it, it still is just bread and wine in your church. And, and so it's like for a Catholic, that's the source and summit of the Christian life. Like that's everything. That's because it's Jesus. The difference between that and the Catholic church is the difference between a piece of bread and Jesus Christ himself, which is infinitely different. <laughs> could it be? I was like, stark. Mm-hmm. Could you think of a more major thing than that? Like that mm-hmm. is so major. And, and so, okay, I can agree with that sentimentality, but the reality is that we have different majors. And so this is a problem. And when it comes to Christian unity, which I'm so passionate about because this ties into evangelism, like what we're talking about, go preach the gospel, preach the gospel to the nations. It's like, Without the Eucharist, what gospel are you really preaching? Without actual unity of mind that it talks about over and over in Scripture, Mm -hmm. you know, what it's sending to the world is a message of disunity. They don't even agree with each other what they teach. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus' own prayer that they would be one, that the Father or that the world would know that the Father sent the Son is not being fulfilled right now. Mm -hmm. So the impetus for me desiring for all Christians, all people to become in to become catholic to come into full communion the catholic church is not just that they themselves could now experience the deepest form of intimacy with jesus christ possible but also that the world would know that jesus is the christ the son of the living god Mm -hmm. because right now our witness is being tarnished uh, because of the disunity i know i agree and if you take uh, if you take the idea of unity you realize that you cannot even apply that to protestantism as a whole it just doesn't make sense like i know because i know sometimes we'll say that the, the body of, of christ is just anybody who affirms as as kind of a christian but that doesn't work because you can take the the concept of unity and remove that from protestantism and nothing changes literally nothing changes but you can't do that to catholicism catholicism is irreducibly unified right it, it is hierarchical uh it's visible it is unified 
Uh, mm. And of course, we would both argue that's because that is the ch- that is the body of Christ that the Catholic right. Church is. So I think that there's kind of a even just a philosophical argument there, just from the concept of unity. That we can see very clearly that if if you're thinking that unity is is uh, you know the way Protestants think about it, of like pins in, in a cushion or something like that, of this of sort of like the invisible body of Christ, you can just remove that concept entirely and nothing changes, which shows that that is not essential to what Protestantism is. And, and it really isn't an actual unity. That's the point, right? It's just a kind of a collection of different people who sometimes share the same label. That's it. There's, there's and, really no unity there. Right. And there's levels of unity. Like uh, in the Catholic Church herself teaches that everyone who's baptized is part of the body of Christ, although we're not in perfect communion yet, like we're, we're united in certain ways or like, and you can see that even with other religions, like we're unified uh, with the the Muslims, for instance, in calling God merciful, let's say mm-hmm. that, or we're unified, um, you know, with different, different levels of Christianity, different denominations in various ways. Like we've been praying to the one true God. We believe in praying in, to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or, you know, there's levels of unity, but when you look at Jesus' prayer and, and you really think deeply about these things, it's like, okay, why would we stop short from full visible unity? Like, why would we settle for some shallow unity that actually is so watered down that nobody knows what the gospel is anymore? <laughs> nobody knows where to even look to find the Eucharist, my goodness. Um, and so the Eucharist becomes a source of unity. Yeah. And that's, that's why it's so major as well. And- and the other thing that really got me that I don't think gets enough discussion in these conversations uh, is, is it, you know, when uh, Jesus gives the grounds for excommunication um, and, and how, you know, take it before the church and how you could ever make sense of that outside of, out of the Catholic church. Cause it seems like at any point that somebody would want to take it before the church and, and the disagreement isn't settled or there's no authority or hierarchy, they will just schizzle. They'll go and start through. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what continues to happen. I was just sitting down with a, a friend who was evangelical the other night, and that's literally what happened at his own church, right? They just had the disagreements. Um, so it seems like there's only two options there. You either dilute doctrine to the point that it just becomes so uninteresting that nobody mm-hmm. can disagree, or you just schism and just go and start your, your own your own church, right? And, and, and mm-hmm. that's, that's why we have uh, so, so much disunity now. Um, whereas if Christ really did leave us with a visible hierarchical sacramental unified church, the Catholic church, then, then that makes sense, right? That right. Because now we have the authority that, uh, yeah, you can actually take things before the church and it can actually mean something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I obviously see my Protestant brothers and sisters as that, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And as someone who used to be estranged from the family of the Catholic Church, you know, from the Catholic Church's perspective, it's like they, they, they left. And, and nowadays, it's through no fault of their own. Most, most likely, they grew up that way like I did. But what a beautiful thing is, is it when estranged family members come back and share in the same feast, in the same mm-hmm. table, and have that restored unity. And so I think we're on the precipice of a lot, a lot of people coming back into full communion with the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that it's like, I can see it for myself in my own story that certain elements of evangelicalism and even the charismatic church and elements in Protestantism are great precursors or preparations for that full communion. One of which being that emphasis on personal relationship with Christ um, with the charismatic emphasis on the presence of God. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so all those different emphasis and also a huge one in most of the churches I was part of in college and beyond was this emphasis on the early church. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, back then, nobody unpacked what the early church actually believed. They restricted it to the book of Acts. And Acts, the book of Acts itself leaves off as like almost a cliffhanger in Acts 28. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the end of the story. Yes, the canons close after the scripture, of course, but the story continues. Like, did the, did the disciples fail or succeed in disciples of all nations? I think they succeeded. Okay, great. What did their disciples believe? We have their writings. And Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's why we both are, are greatly affected by the early church fathers because that was something huge for me is like, okay, I'm a 21st century American. 
I don't even trust my own interpretation of the scriptures at this point. How do on earth do I know what they're even saying? Well, you know what? I want to listen to what the earliest disciples had to say, Mm -hmm. because maybe they have better insight onto what actually happened and what's going on than I do. And that lens by which you can now see the scriptures, that early church lens, man, that makes everything come together. The breaking of the bread in Acts, that was code for Eucharist Mm -hmm. because they knew him in the breaking of the bread. Oh my goodness, we thought that was just a family meal. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that that actually meant something. That actually had a link to the Last Supper. and But the early church knew it very well. Mm -hmm. So there's all those things that are going in there that leads to the conclusion, okay, there really was a church started, and but wait, it actually continued. And those teachings that are so foundational and majors <laughs> um, are present today in the Catholic church, undefiled, undisturbed, pure in, in, in all of its purity. And so it's like, okay, that's what I want to be part of. And that's something I told my friends this week. And I was with uh, my three best friends are all not Catholic actually. And mm-hmm. Um, it was like, you know what, guys, I, I, it's basically like, I got tired of trying to figure everything out. And I, you know, the goal isn't that the goal isn't necessarily that y'all become Catholic, right? The goal is that we would all go to heaven, that we'd all be in heaven. Mm -hmm. But my question to them was, what has heaven told us on how to get there? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so when I look to the lives of the saints and with Protestantism, we have a common patrimony before 1500. Okay, so what did St. Francis of Assisi, what was he a part of? What did he believe? Okay, what about St. John Damascene? What about St. John Chrysostom? What about St. Augustine, who everyone loves? What about Mm -hmm. St. Athanasius and St. Polycarp and St. Ignatius of Antioch and St. Clement of Rome? And it's Mm -hmm. like, they were all Catholic. They all believed in the Eucharist. They all subscribed to this thing that is the church that Jesus started. Yeah, it it is amazing, isn't it? Because if like... Because what's what's the alternative, right? So I guess if when I was kind of going to various Protestant um, denominations, it was it was like what did I what would I have had to have assumed if I stuck with that? I guess I would have had to assume that there was some great initial apostasy, and that God just you know let let His uh, church pretty much dissolve, like the Holy Spirit came and then immediately left and wander around in utter confusion for about fifteen hundred years until until who until John Calvin. Is that no Luther? <laughs> well, no. That, I'm just saying, like, take who you want, right? It could be yeah, Luther, yeah. but obviously Calvinists would think differently, or or, or Wesley, or Wesley, yeah, or somebody, right? Just somebody, and like, okay, like maybe, maybe, but also maybe not. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, what's interesting about that, Pat, is that my friend Ethan and I, during our conversion process, after we had started tapping into some of these thoughts, we actually ran into some Mormon missionaries. Uh, in the apartment complex we were at. And honestly, it was amazing coming from a Catholic vantage point because their whole claim is that after the last apostle died, the church did do that. It went apostate. And then it was um, Joseph Smith Mm -hmm. that rediscovered it in the golden tablets or whatever in the mid 1800s. And we just told him like, we'll prove it, like prove that the church fell because I'm actually reading the early disciples and they're all in unison and, and in unity with what the scripture teaches and what comes after them as well. Mm-hmm. And so I, you can't prove it. Like, that's the thing is like, it's not, it's just not true. And, but if I would have encountered them as just like a, like a few years before, <laughs> uh, yeah. I would have been like, well, you just, you got yeah, some, I, I, think a, yeah, I think, I think, I think as Protestants, Mormons can, can, can pose a, a fair objection. Can't they? Yeah. Right. But it's, it, Catholicism is pretty much immune to it. <laughs> right. Because it's like, well, that's just not true. Here's the documents to prove it, you know. Um, yeah. So, all right. Take us, take us into some of these church fathers because your podcast is called Polycarp's Paradigm. Do you want, do you want to start with him? I want to hear specifically, uh, obviously, you've, you've hinted very strongly at the Eucharist, but what your beliefs were and then how a study of the early church and church fathers challenges beliefs, changes beliefs, and led you to the Catholic Church. Let's just dive into some examples, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll actually, um, I'll start with St. Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, he was martyred in about 107 AD, mm-hmm. and he was a disciple of the Apostle John. Okay, so <laughs> the guy who literally penned the Gospel of John in the book of Revelation, this was his disciple, Ignatius of Antioch. Yeah. 
Hard, First, to, hard, hard to get much closer than that. Right, exactly. Um, and one of the major attractions I had to him right away is that he has this crazy longing to be martyred and he tells people like, hey, I'm about to be martyred in Rome. So he writes seven letters to churches on his way to his martyrdom. Mm -hmm. And in almost every single one of them, he's saying, hey, like, I'm so excited for this. Like the mouths of lions are my gateway into heaven. Yep. Like stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And ever since I was in third grade, actually, I told my mom, like, I want to be a martyr <laughs> and quoted to her Philippians one where it says for to me to live is Christ to die is gain. And she was like, don't ever quote that to me again. <laughs> because no, no mother wants to hear that her son wants to just die. Right. <laughs> yeah. Even if uh, it's for the faith, I guess. But, uh, but, but Ignatius resonated with me so strongly because I was like, yes, that's it. Like, that's what I want to. Uh -huh. But what's funny with him is he actually does write. I think it was to the letter to the Romans. He says, Hey, uh, when I get there, remember what I said in this letter that I don't want you to discourage me from getting eaten by the lions. Cause when I get there, I might change my mind and freak out, you know? <laughs> yeah, rightfully so. Right. Yeah. Um, but what's great about him is that, so in about one Oh eighty one Oh seven, he is writing to these seven churches, the church in Smyrna. Well, where does that, you know, like we have that in, in the book of revelation as well, the church of Smyrna. So it's the same churches that are there uh, that are going and he's writing things saying, hey, the, the Eucharist really is the body and blood of Christ. It's the flesh and blood of Christ. Uh, and, and so he's just, he pulls no punches. He doesn't even like try to explain that really. He's just like, here's the mystery, but it, this is the truth. Mm -hmm. And what's cool about that is that the Apostle John was, he, he's the one in his gospel that has that, that bread of life discourse where Jesus in John chapter six literally says, my flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. You need to eat my flesh and drink my blood or else you have no life in you. Mm -hmm. And so the same author of that, obviously inspired with the Holy Spirit, he, tr he passes that teaching down to his disciple Ignatius and he echoes that. He echoes that teaching. And, and then he's also talking, and this was a huge part of his writings too for me, is because Okay, even if you say, okay, he's definitely into the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Well, what about the church structure? I mean, surely it doesn't look like a pope and like all these bishops, right? You know? Um, well, just you wait. Just you wait till you read Ignatius. And he talks about how you need to submit to the bishop as if he's Jesus Christ in your midst. Mm -hmm. And so when the early church is interpreting verses like when Jesus tells his apostles, whoever receives you receives me. Whoever does not receive you does not receive me, re rejects me. And they took that very seriously to mean the bishops because they were successors of the apostles. Like that's just what happened. The apostles left these, these bishops um, as their successors. And we get that word, I believe it's in uh, first or second Timothy episkopos, which in Protestant translations is translated as overseer, but the Greek word is episkopos where we get the word bishop from. Mm -hmm. And Ignatius is already saying, Hey, you need to submit to that bishop. And then you have presbyters, which we get the word priests from that. Mm -hmm. uh, in Protestant translations, you'll see that as elders. So like, like in First Peter, talking about submit to your elders, yep. um, presbyters. And so to this day, the Catholic Church, the group of priests in a diocese is called part of the, they're part of the presbyterate, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the deacons, which we see that in the book of Acts, you know, the apostles instituting the, the diaconate. And so mm -hmm. that's, it's a really a simple structure. It's not complicated. It's bishops, priests, and deacons. Yep. The, the, now the Pope is, he's a bishop. He's the Bishop of Rome. And so he's the successor of St. Peter. And Peter was the head of, of the apostles um, in the Bible. You can see that very clearly in, in Matthew 16. He's the only one given the actual keys of the kingdom. Fortunately, they do all share the, the power to bind and loose. But a huge um, paradigm shift with thinking, okay, that's great, but that's just one interpretation, right? Well, then you read the early church fathers. You read the letter of St. Clement of Rome to the Corinthians. Okay, why is Clement of Rome writing with such authority to a church that's not, quote unquote, in his jurisdiction? Like it's in Corinth, not in Rome. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you find out that First Clement almost made it into scripture, like they reverenced that letter so much, it became part of their liturgies. Yep. Like they would read it. And, and, and they actually respected his letter so much um, and that they did those things. And it shows the reverence for the Bishop of Rome right there. And so if you actually go on the Vatican website, you can see all the popes from Francis today, 
Pope Francis all the way back to Peter. And I believe it's the fourth Pope that's Pope Clement of Rome. So you have Peter Linus. He's the fourth or the third, I think. It's, no, he's a third. Yeah, yeah, third. Is he? Yeah, I think he's the fourth. I think. It's yeah, you're right. Third, it's the third Linus successor. Jesus. So yeah, so he would be number. Yeah. He would be number four. Third successor. So number. Yep. Four. Yep. yep. And uh, yes. So you see that, and you're like, okay. And that letter, in and of itself, is just a beautiful, beautiful letter. Do you um, mind if I actually read a quote, uh, two quotes from Saint Ignatius? Because I think. Oh, that go for it. These yeah. Are, these are the two that really got me, and we can get your your kind of comments on here and. Um, I'll start with letter to the Romans. And again, you know, the, they, they, or no, I'll do epistle to the Philadelphians. This one was, uh, and, and, you know, the kind of dating here is, is I think most historians say somewhere between 80 to a hundred, you know, 110 AD, um, which is, I mean, it's hard to get any earlier than, I mean, right. one could make the argument that it's even before the gospel of John was written. Right. Uh, or at least the book of revelation. Yeah. At least the book of revelation, but, but even if not, it still has tremendous force. So I, I'll just quote here. Um, take care then who belong to God and to Jesus Christ. They are with the Bishop and those who repent and come to the unity of the church. They too shall be of God and will be living according to Jesus Christ. Do not err my brother. Uh, if anyone follow a schismatic, he will not inherit the kingdom of God. That line got me, Eric, <laughs> that line concerned yep. me. If any man walk, about what strange doctrine he cannot lie down with passion. Take care then to use one Eucharist, so that whatever you do, you do according to God. For there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, and one cup in union of his blood, one altar, and there is one bishop with the presbytery, and my fellow servants, the deacons. I mean, there you have it. I mean, <laughs> I mean holy cow, man. When I first started yeah. reading this stuff, I'm like, that's, that's Catholic. <laughs> And that very uncomfortable Catholic. for me right now because I've never done that or been part of that. And I've been Christian my whole life. Ah. Uh, yeah, it just smacked me so hard. And that's not just like some obscure example. This right. is, this just is the early church fathers. That's it. That's yeah. it. The, the unity of the church, the hierarchy, the visibility, the sacramentality, it is all there. And it's not like this is hard to find. Like anybody mm -hmm. who is seriously seeking and that's, and that's the thing that I, that I ask is like, look, we, we do want unity. Of course we do. Everybody wants that. Everybody wants the, what is good mm -hmm. for, for everybody else. And what is, what is the most good for any of us is to have the most intimate relationship with God that we possibly can. Right. And, and it seems to me that if, if, you know, that if we take a serious, you know, I go back to John Henry Newman, his famous quote that, you know, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Mm -hmm. And you go back and you study these church fathers and you see this language and it couldn't be any more direct. I mean, that's the thing. Like they, they did not, like you said, they pulled zero punches here. Uh, and some of it, I have to say, did give me the chills and how direct it was by saying, if you follow schismatic, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Like that's, that's forceful language, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and it should give anybody serious pause and at least enough to, to consider, consider the arguments and, and the veracity of this stuff. So anyways, I just wanted to read, I'll just leave it at that one. We can come back to other quotes later if we want, but, uh, I mean, again, none of this stuff is hard to find. Like you can find this a anywhere. The original, the, the letter to the, uh, Sumerians, Ephesians, Romans from St. Ignatius, it's, it's all over. Right. And he's, he's yep. just one of the church fathers, just one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I mean, and his contemporary St. Polycarp, who I've, Name my podcast after Polycarp's Paradigm um, because he's my patron saint. He was actually my confirmation saint as well uh, because he's also a martyr. Uh, so that's awesome. But he, he was a martyr at the age of 86. And he was also a disciple of the apostle uh, John. He uh, was martyred around AD 155. And his martyrdom story is actually recorded and it's the first martyrdom story that we even have outside of the scripture. So like after St. Stephen, it's like the one that's recorded. Obviously there was plenty of martyrs before that with the apostles and the Ignatius, obviously. Um, but he was known for his holiness and godliness. And, uh, and I loved his name quite honestly, it's such a weird name. Polycarp. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he also bears witness um, to these things and uh, it's, just powerful to me the witness of the martyrs that they're willing to die for their faith and you know for him they tried to burn with fire and he actually had a vision of this a few uh, days before his martyrdom mm -hmm. and so that kind of shows a little bit of the charismatic underlines uh, going on there that they still believed in visions and miracles and all these things 
and he has a vision of this and then it actually happens. He gets burned, but his body doesn't con- get consumed by the fire. Instead of sweet fragrance comes out off of him. Mm-hmm. And then eventually they stab him and he bleeds so much that it quenches the fire and eventually he dies. But his martyrdom sparked, you know, even more people coming into the Catholic church then. Um, and so I love him. He was Bishop of Smyrna. So once again, a bi- he himself is a bishop and I chose him as my patron saint, confirmation saint, because he is that invaluable link that links us from the apostles uh, to and the scriptures to church tradition and the bishops. And so it's just, it, it speaks of my conversion in a profound way because that link is what I needed to see to know that this is really the church Jesus started and sustains and continues to, to be the head of. And so... That was huge. But the writings of St. Ignatius were were really powerful for me. The writings of St. Justin Martyr were huge for me. Uh, He describes the the mass and talks about the liturgy of the word, then going into prayers for the faithful and the liturgy of the Eucharist, which when I saw that and then I experienced mass, I was like, oh, wait, they're doing the same thing he was talking about. What? So once again, that was so awesome for me in, in having that heart to be part of the early church and realizing I found it. St. Justin Martyr bears witness that this is what the early church did. This is how they lived out their Christian faith. Um, and speaking of St. Justin Martyr, I actually do have a quote, if you don't mind. Yeah, I have one too. I wonder if it's the same oh. one. You, you go ahead. Yep. <laughs> um, so this has to do with the Eucharist, of course. And he says, we call this food Eucharist. Yep, this is and the one. No one yeah. is, <laughs> it is? Okay, cool. And no one is permitted to partake of it except one who believes our teaching to be true. For not as common bread nor common drink do we receive these, but since Jesus Christ, our Savior, was made incarnate by the word of God and had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so too, as we have been taught, the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer set down by him and by the change of which our blood and flesh is nourished is both the flesh and blood of that incarnated Jesus. Mm, I mean, there's so much there that is, that. that, I mean, first off, people ask, well, well, why don't Catholics admit non-Catholics to the Eucharist? The answer is right here. They never did, right? (laughs) They just, that's, that's just one of those things that they have never done. It goes right back to the beginning. And, but also here, aside from obviously talking about the real presence that they were clearly devoted to that, I think it's so important to say that consecrated by the Eucharistic prayer. So it's yeah. not, it's not receptionism. It's not like, oh, I think Jesus is there. Or, you know, if I'm just, in the if I believe it, it's true, mind, you know, yeah, yeah. If I, it's not that this is a, this is a reality is so much more fundamental that is consecrated by the actual prayer itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is exactly what the church teaches. And here again, so, I mean, there's just so much packed into this one quote that is so Catholic. I mean, I I don't see how you could, could get away from it. (laughs) And the context with which he's writing those words is he's currently being accused by the emperor and all Christians are being accused of, of cannibalism because they're Mm -hmm. talking about these things. And he could have easily said, no, 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 we're just, it's just a symbol. Mm -hmm. Like, don't worry. Like it's just a symbol. But say he says, no, like it really is the flesh and blood of Christ. Um, but he'll go on to say like, but actually it's the resurrected Christ. And so we're not cannibals. We're not taking his life uh, without, de- with, by depleting it. We're actually receiving life from the Eucharist. And so he defends the real presence and pushes further and defends the resurrection, mm-hmm. which the Eucharist and the resurrection go hand in hand and, and, and the ascension by the way, as well. It's not like Jesus is, is just gone in heaven. It's that now that he is at the right hand of the Father, he transcends and can be present everywhere in the Eucharist throughout the world and also in the least of these, of course, and where, wherever two or three are gathered uh, spiritually as well. Um, but his incarnational presence expands because of the ascension, not just leaves us as orphans because he himself said, I will be with you. Yes, he, he's going to leave us the Holy Spirit, but he himself said in Matthew, and I will be with you to the end of the age. I'm I'm glad you actually brought up the cannibalism point because that's a, a common you know charge that's just thrown yeah. out there. But it, it's not for the reasons that you just said. Cannibalism destroys somebody; it destroys their body. Right. Christ is alive, and we're being right. nourished by His body. Mm-hmm. So, so fundamentally, very, yeah. very different there. So I'm glad that it, yeah, and, and we partake of His body to become His body. And and also one thing with my paradigm before becoming Catholic as to the early church was just, we would always say things like, we just want the simple gospel or the simple church or the house church, like that we saw in the book of Acts and all that. And 
And it's like, okay, well, what, what did the early church define as the simple church? And I think you, you read it perfectly in St. Ignatius' quote. The early church defined just the church. Like if you want to just get really simple, it's centered on the Eucharist and under the authority of the bishop, the validly ordained bishop from the successor of the apostle. So you need a bishop, you need the Eucharist. And that's pretty simple. And then you can actually then fulfill what Acts 2.42 says and, and that you, you can daily go be in fellowship with believers, be under apostolic teaching, um, be praying together, and enjoy the breaking of the bread, the Eucharist. And so you have the apostolic authority, the fellowship, the prayers, the breaking of the bread, the Eucharist, all there. And we currently still have that in the Mass, and we get to go to daily Mass, so we get to fulfill Acts 2.42 as Catholics every single day. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, that was something that always I thought was quote unquote cool about Catholicism before I was a Catholic was that they just had that, that daily, that daily thing. Cause I always figured like if something is important, especially like religion, like ultimate importance, it seems like you might want to do it every day. Right. Mm-hmm. So uh, any other church fathers you think are worth touching on or that, that influenced uh, your conversion, helped to change your, your worldview, shift your paradigm, all that stuff. Well, you know, I think these ones are, really important. St. Irenaeus as well. Um, he has more quotes about all this, but the reason why, yeah, yeah, the reason why all of these ones were so important to me is because I had read a book years before exploring this that taught that just basically their whole theme was the church is all pagan and we need to get back to house churches. That was the theme of the book. And they derived that from Constantine and like him changing everything. So I really wanted to look into that. And what I discovered through these guys was actually the Catholic Church's beliefs were way before Constantine. Constantine didn't even change anything. All he did was say, hey, it's not illegal to be Catholic anymore or any religion, really. And so they had that Edict of Milan, that tolerance. Yeah, and just to give people a quick perspective, Constantine came to power, what, 306, 307? Yep. We're reading letters between 80 and 110 with, with Ignatius, right? right. Like there's, this is far right. before Constantine. And when they had the Council of Nicaea, they didn't just invent bishops to gather the council. They called upon the current existing bishops to have the council. So bishops were before that time, you know. And, and another piece of just fun fact is that the first 200 years in Christianity, every single pope was martyred. Um. And, and first of all, that's crazy because like, wow, there were popes. <laughs> uh, yep. And secondly, yes, and they were martyred. And and so they really bore witness. But I, you know, going beyond that, I think, especially now that I am Catholic, I just love all of the saints. Uh, I love the modern day saints. I, Saint Faustina is one of my favorites. I just mm. finished reading her diary. And she really rehabilitated my confidence to hear God's voice because she's able to like talk about hearing God's voice, but then also having the external form of a confessor or a priest to check what she's actually getting from God, Mm -hmm. which as a charismatic, um, before Catholicism, I had no one really to check that with. Yeah, I had my peers, but everyone could also say like, well, maybe that's true or maybe that's not. Or, but like with a spiritual authority in your life, it, it's really, um, incarnational, if you will, It like puts flesh and bones on, on things. And so it takes, hearing God's voice takes an external form as well as an internal form. And so I love the modern saints as well. Um, St. Therese of Lisieux, mm-hmm. uh, you know, St. John Paul II, I, I love him. And, and, and we, I mean, I, I was living while he was alive. I didn't appreciate him. <laughs> what Same I was, here. Yeah. Or, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, um, cause I wasn't Catholic at all, but you know, and, and so their stories just inspire me. And what's cool is that the modern saints, the ones in the middle the middle period as well, middle ages, if you will, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, St. Alphonsus Liguri, um, all those guys, you know, St. Bonaventure, they're, they're a pivotal role too. So what's cool is seeing that the consistency, like we were talking about earlier, from Ignatius to Polycarp to Irenaeus, to, which Irenaeus, by the way, was a disciple of St. Polycarp. And then you have, you know, St. Cyprian was huge on church unity, and that was in the 200s that he, he wrote those things. Uh, St. Augustine, St. You know, all these saints, they testify to the Catholic and apostolic church and the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And so it's so cool because now as a Catholic, it's, I don't have to wonder like, well, I wonder what Jesus actually taught. You know, I wonder what he actually meant. Or I, I wonder like, 
what, what is even the gospel? Or like, you know, it's like, no, this, this is the faith that was handed down. And now I receive the faith. It's not something I just have to invent or yeah. to think up. It's, I, it's a gift that I get to receive. Um, and so a lot of peace comes, comes with that. But yeah, those were the main players um, because I wanted to see that the whole Constantine conspiracy was not true and going earlier than that proves it. So. Yeah, going earlier than that obviously is, I think, the, the death blow to the Constantine theory. But it's just also like so, so odd to even assume because before Constantine, there was the, the most horrendous you know, persecution of Christians up to that time where like, Christians were not willing to crook the knee to the emperor. They, they would get eaten by right. lions or heads chopped off, burned. But then suddenly we're supposed to believe that Constantine comes in and everybody just goes along with it. Right. Like, like, hold on. Like, how does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Instead, what you have is uh, it's just you have so the bizarre of a theory, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, what you have is you have the development of monasticism at that point with St. Anthony of the desert, right? Like he's like, okay, now that Christianity is legal, like let's get radical again and go to the desert. <laughs> yep. So, um, but they continue the faith and, and one one important note is that yes, like what we just read with the early church fathers is present in the Catholic Church, but we should also expect that the Catholic Church doesn't look externally maybe exactly like it looked back then when they were being persecuted. Like, of course, they now have buildings which they didn't have before, you know, and that's okay. You know, the substance of it is the same. Yeah. If, if I'm getting philosophical here, the substance is the same. The accidents kind of change over time because of development and. Um, but it's the same substance uh, that's there. It's, the it's kind of like body. a child that like yeah. starts as a toddler. It's like when I when that child's a teenager, it's the same person. It just looks a little different. Yeah, it looks you look different as an infant as you do as an adult. Yeah, that's yep. it. You're the same. The identity is the same over time. And the Holy Spirit continues to guide the church into all truth, and and expound upon that that original deposit of faith. But I love that there is a solid deposit of faith and. The magisterium, the Pope and the bishops in union with him, the teaching authority of the church, they don't, they can't create doctrines. They just, they, they serve the word of God, which is, comes to us in scripture and tradition. They, they're the servants of that and they can explain it and clarify and expound upon it and say, hey, this is just what we've always believed. This is what was handed down to us. And, and so, and we get that with like the, the teachings like on the Trinity. It's like, they didn't invent the Trinity in the Council of Nicaea. They didn't invent the church of the Immaculate Conception in the 1850s, they declared it, they clarified it, but that was always part of the, the deposit of faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's so incredibly well said. And and I, I really like how you phrase it as this this gift that you receive, which is which mm-hmm. is kind of funny because I you know I think a, a common objection to the Catholic Church is that uh, you know, this this misunderstanding of good works, but you look at infant baptism and like what I mean, like you couldn't get more of a gift than that, right? Like that's right. you're the most you're, you're the most innocent you could possibly be, and you're just receiving this this pure gift, this pure act of love uh, that you that you couldn't work mm-hmm. for, you couldn't even conceivably work for it at that point, right? So it's mm-hmm. kind of funny uh, because then you know if you if you don't accept infant baptism, you, you do kind of have to work for it at some point right. in, in the Protestant world. Yeah, you mean you know, maybe you work through it. Uh, you earned your salvation by your rational intellect telling you to make a public confession of faith. Yeah. Something mm-hmm. like that. Um, but yeah, no, I know I mentioned that to my Protestant friends a lot. You know, we believe in infant baptism. Well, it's hard because sometimes they're like, well, I don't believe in infant baptism. Well, that's not my point. My point is that we do believe in infant baptism and baptism. Baptism actually is the starting point of the salvation process. Like it says that in first Peter, baptism now saves you. Mm-hmm. And so we believe that these babies are saved and they're in the process of salvation. Right. And they did nothing. They didn't earn that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, as Catholics, we believe that God always initiates the grace. And then we have the privilege of cooperating with that grace. And that's just relationship. That's just what works just as part of a relationship. You know, your mm-hmm. faith is perfected by works. Uh, the only mention of faith alone in all of scriptures in James where it says that man is not justified by faith alone, but by works. And, um, and so as Catholics, we believe that faith needs to express itself in charity, as it says in, in Galatians, that faith working through love. And love is the chief work. And you'll see that theme over and over in the scriptures where Jesus is like, you need to love as I love. That's the new commandment. Love as I love. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And, and that emphasis is, is so huge, but that was a huge a paradigm shift for me as well, because I grew up with the mentality and I hear it all the time as well. Like you just believe that you need to earn your salvation or works, 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 works. And actually when I got confirmed and received the Eucharist for the very first time, my priest was very clear with me. He said, Eric, you do not take the Eucharist. You receive the Eucharist. It is a gift. Jesus is a gift. And that's the intimacy. That's the relationship is he gives his whole self to me. In return, I give my whole self to him. And thus I enter into that beautiful unity with the Trinity where now I'm one with Christ. And now one by virtue of that, I'm, I, I'm in the, a child of the father and, and with the Holy spirit. And so I'm entering into that Trinitarian love and so, yes, works play a huge part in that. Faith plays a huge part of it, but it's all sourced in grace. And the faith and works is just the natural relationship that develops, really. Be- I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to blemish that 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 beautiful statement. It actually makes me want to run to mass right now. <laughs> but um, all right, this is this has been so good, Eric. I really appreciate you taking the time to detail this for us. Um, we're going to have to make this a multiple parter because there's a million other things I want to continue talking mm-hmm. with you about and that we can continue to talk about. But in the meantime, before we get there, uh, let everybody know how they can uh, get in contact w- with you, how they can keep up with your work, whether the places to follow you, listen to your podcast, just, just give us all those details. Yes. Um, okay. So Polycarp's Paradigm, that's the name of my podcast. That's the name of my, my YouTube channel. And that's actually the name of my website that I just started as well. So polycarpsparadigm.com. Um, if you want to contact me, you can actually contact me uh, via email, eric at polycarpsparadigm.com. Would love to hear from you. Um, and then, uh, so that's where, where you can mainly find me is, is those avenues. Uh, would love for you all to check out the podcast, uh, especially. And then I did write a book uh, called Thoughts of a Changed Mind, Letters from Father to Son. Uh, you can find it on lulu.com or amazon.com. And anyway, that's, that's a, I, I've, I've gotten great feedback from it. It's written as if I'm a father to my son. I'm, I'm not married and don't have children. So it's fictional context, but it's, it allowed me to write short letters to basically pass on everything I wanted to hand down <laughs> uh, to, to, to the next generation it says, Hey, here's what God taught me. And the unique part about it is that I wrote it. Literally, I started it right before I entered the Catholic Church and continued writing and finished it after I had become Catholic. And so it kind of encompasses that transition. So it captures a lot of thoughts I had before becoming Catholic and then as I'm a Catholic and, and all of that. And so, yeah, I would love um, for your listeners to check out those things if they're interested and would love to definitely um, continue this conversation because this is honestly really life-giving and fun for me as well. So <laughs> I love it. It's so great. And I'm going to link all that in the show notes, just so easy access there. And Eric, I look forward to uh, continuing this conversation with you soon. All right. Thanks. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.